All right. So uh, we have just about uh, 25 minutes left. Several of you have texted in questions. Uh, we're going to try to get to as many of those as we can, but we always like to spend uh, just the last few moments of the workshop covering a variety of subjects. Dr. Ducing, thank you so much for being with us. I want to just open this time uh, by asking you a question that I get often when students start diving into a subject. You mentioned this earlier. Uh, reading something for the first time, we may have known who Luther was, and then we see how much he wrote and how many of the things uh, in our world were affected by the things he wrote, and it can be overwhelming. What encouragement would you have for somebody that is just uh, you know, kind of opening the door to historical theology and may, may be a bit discouraged or overwhelmed by all the things that they see that they don't know? Any encouragement for students kind of in that slew of despond? Yeah, I, I think some of this you know, will echo some of the things I say, but um, it's the perspective component of zooming out and zooming in is, is so helpful um, in terms of just, yeah, there's a lot, um, you know, one of the things that we could have talked about today, but I didn't, is I just think that one of the wonderful things about historical theology and church history and the study is it actually has this sort of sneak, and, sneak attack component in it and that it really humbles you and it helps you grow in humility. And uh, because so much of it is just even this recognition is there's far more here than I can possibly it just puts the weight on you that I'm finite and have limits. And even though I may have been the smartest person in my class or whatever else, actually, <laughs> I, I don't know all these kinds of things. So just take, take the lesson of humility, but then just continue to just plot along and read that. We all have 168 hours in a week, you know, seven days like that. It's just it's sort of how you use that time and, um, and just chip away at things. I mean, some of that's strategy, but that's yeah. how I would start, yeah. That's good. I know uh, you were talking through, and you mentioned some of this, so maybe just press in a little bit deeper here. If you watch, like, the History Channel, National Ge Geographic, or whatever, and it's talking about kind of the, the early church and how we got uh, doctrine and creeds, it, it kind of gives this impression of, like, these, these guys in a smoke-filled room in the dark somewhere kind of imposed upon Christians what we are to actually believe. It's much more organic than that. And you, you mentioned how they're kind of looking at the Scriptures. Maybe speak a little bit into... The, the kind of scriptural basis grounding for the creeds and confessions and, and really the faith that we confess even today. Yeah. Well, a lot of that imagery, and I know you're just sort of making that up, you know, in terms of guys in a room or whatever. The reason why that image even comes to mind is because of the ways in which Christianity evolved since then. And I talked a little bit about this as far as um, Roman Catholicism elevation of tradition. And so when you have Roman Catholic theology developing tradition, I'll just call it with a capital T, and saying that's actually more important than Scripture. If Scripture and tradition ever conflict, we go with tradition. And you have the elevation of, of uh, church offices and ultimately the Pope, and then they reference the creeds and confessions. It makes it sound like, well, that's who was doing it back then too, and that isn't the case. That's all an evolution after that period of time. So part of what even Luther's doing is you have to jump over that era back and sort of read them for themselves. And what you find, that's why Augustine, thinking of Augustine as a pastor is so helpful, because that's what he was. He's preaching every week, he's looking at the scriptures. Many of the other church fathers, and there was no such thing as a professional theologian. They were all pastors in places and things, helping, trying to help churches work through issues. And so those creeds and confessions, the best way I think of summarizing them is that their entire purpose then, and their purpose for us today, is they just help define and defend what we believe, define and defend. And they're defining, again, they're summaries, they're defining uh, what we believe. And we do this all the time ourselves anyway. Of course, we uphold the scriptures, but when you're wanting to make, see if you're on the same page with someone, is, you know, just pick something. Well, do you understand um, um, some doctrine, baptism, this way? Yeah, we, we do it this way. Well, you're summarizing what you need scriptures, and sometimes you're referencing scriptures. That's what those early believers were doing, is we need a document that summarizes how we read the Bible together, um, here it is. It's going to define what we believe. It also defends. When people come in and say, well, we believe this, they say, no, uh, this is what we said we're going to believe. Contradict that. And Christians throughout all of history, Catholics, non-Catholics, and especially Baptists, this is what they've always done. So we need these summary documents, not more important than scriptures, but summary of scriptures. And so we understand it that way. You're just sort of looking over those early Christians' shoulders as they're looking at scripture, as they're summarizing it. You, 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 we should feel free to say, well, did they summarize it right? It's not scripture, you know, and if they did, let's use it, and if they didn't, then 
um, especially for more modern confessions of faith, well, let's revise them because they're just tools, you know. Right. And really, in, everyone has some kind of confession or creed. It may or may not be written down, right? Because whenever you get to the next level of question, okay, yeah, we believe, you know, John says the Word became flesh. Well, what does that mean? And you say something outside of Scripture, you're having to actually define what you're saying, and that's what a creed confession is actually doing. Yes. Uh, and everyone has that. They have some thought. They just might not ever write it down so it can never be evaluated. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I was encouraged when you, you talked about, uh, you know, we are free to criticize those who came before us respectfully, but we, we can see their errors. They are not infallible. Uh, and just as we think about, um, you know, Baptist life today, that, that also still applies. Uh, there's, there's a lot of good and there's a lot that's, that's difficult in being a part of a, a large denomination. I know you're deeply involved in denominational life, you're headed uh, from here to an executive committee meeting. I, I was wondering, for those that are, you know, kind of follow the ups and downs of uh, Southern Baptist life, is there anything you're particularly encouraged about, uh, about the direction Southern Baptists are heading right now? I, I, it's an easy question for me to answer because I work and live every day at a Southern Baptist seminary and deal with people from age 18 up all the time who are there to study, and they're all amazing. And if that's the future, if those are the future leaders those are future church workers, counselors, and missionaries. Well, then I think everything's going to be fine. If that's you know. so, so I, it's easy for me not to kind of get distracted by the, the you know the more negative or more political things because I'm seeing that, and that is a kind of a rule of thumb of what I talk when I talk to pastors and things like that. I just said, look, the the essence of the SBC is really what's happening in your local church. That really the focus just is local. Um, we only cooperate at a national level originally just to fund missionaries. Churches can send more missionaries if they pull resources together to do that. And then people think, well, we need to provide training for those missionaries. Not all the churches can provide training, so let's fund seminaries to train them and then send them out. That in its core is why all these churches begin cooperating. I think that's the same reason why they all still need to cooperate. Everything else can just, it matters, but it's distraction. Yeah. You know, So if you just stay focused on yeah, we're a part of the Southern Baptist Convention for those reasons, missionary sending, training of people. That means that we're def sort of connected to all these other things, but that's not really why we're in it. So we're not, we're not, not going to worry about those things. We're focusing on the core. So those two things, what, what it's really all about. And then I think anyone would be encouraged if they showed up at Midwestern Seminary and they saw what was happening there to say, oh, well, if that's the future of church leadership in our mm -hmm. convention of churches, it's going to be fine. And, it, and I think it really will be, yeah. This is a bit like lightning roundy, so they're not necessarily connected. But we had a question come in. You had mentioned Timothy George a number of times. Someone had asked, what are some books you would recommend by Timothy George? Maybe it's, maybe it's their first time hearing about him or some things they wanted to read. What would you recommend? I think the, the best book to recommend is a book he wrote called Theology of the Reformers. Theology of the Reformers. And it came out in 2013 as a 25th anniversary edition, I think it was. So you want the 25th anniversary edition because he adds more to it. But it's, um, I, I literally mean we all want to be like Timothy George when we grow up. What that is, is each chapter is a theological biography of main, main reformers. As well. And it's, it is amazing, yeah. That's great. Uh, I've wanted to ask you this for a while, and especially in, in this forum. One of the, the most important traditions my family has at Christmas time. Uh, is the reading of Tolkien's uh, Father Christmas Letters, uh, which came about because of uh, a talk you gave uh, about a tradition in your family. And it's one of the things that has been helpful for me in studying church history in an academic sense, not kind of getting lost in the weeds, uh, but also embracing beauty through fiction, Tolkien, Lewis, uh, folks like that. How has that worked in your own life? And, and maybe why is that balance important if we want to study the past deeply? How do we, how do we avoid just it becoming an academic discipline and, and missing the beauty that's there? The, uh, that's yeah, a great, great question. The uh, famous uh, British preacher who's died in the 1980s, Martin Lloyd-Jones, if anyone's heard of him, one of the preeminent, you know, verse-by-verse -verse preachers in England and London uh, from the World War II area, era through the 1960s. Uh, he said that, um, you know, he says, when I grow tired of reading something, uh, I, I shouldn't stop reading. I just need to read a, some, read a different type of book mm -hmm. or a different type of genre. Um, and I found that to be true, you know, so for my job and what I get to do, and it's, it's amazing. I mean, I'm, aside from the administrative part of what I do, I read and write, and I grade what other people have read and written, you know, so, and that can, can get taxing, and so I, I do love church history and historical theology, and I'm reading deeply in those things all the time. I've just found in my own life that to shift from that and not stop reading, but reading fiction or um, uh, English literature is another hobby of mine and, and other things like this, that 
It's just provided balance and context. And then what I found is that the two start working together. It's sort of like fiction and these other things provide um, color and music and life and all these mm. other bring bring old dead text to life and, yeah. and things like that. So um, the Inklings, Lewis, Tolkien in particular, but their circle of friends and the, the things they wrote, I've just found. Uh, I've enjoyed I enjoyed what they wrote and the fantasy literature and all that stuff. If you start quizzing me on all the different layers of Lord of the Rings, I I will disappoint you on what little I know. I've always been more attracted to the men themselves um, yeah. and the lives they led and the things mm. that they wrote and that kind of thing. So that's great. Yeah. We, we only gave you three sessions, and so you had to skip over some of church history. It's hard to get all that in in uh, three sessions. We had had someone write in. You you had mentioned how uh, Luther's kind of looking around the medieval period back into the early church, saying that we need to recover some of what was was lost here. Why maybe speak into that medieval spot then? Why was there such a long time where some kind of um, divergent spots off of Augustine came before Luther says, and, and the Reformation kind of says, we need to go back to what was being taught yeah. before. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, we do call it proverbially the Dark Ages. It doesn't mean nothing was happening. In fact, a lot of was happening, and even in terms of theological thought, early foundations were still being laid for a later... Reformation just does It sounds like it happens out of nothing, but it's actually been built upon we call them pre-reformers. Many, many theologians and others starting to call for reform, but they don't have the avenues to, to pull it out. So it, it's not all dark. Uh, but part of the reasons why the jumping over it is just that it's both theological and political corruption happens. And I, I do anchor that into this merger of church and state, that the two being connected inevitably goes corrupt, uh, which is why many of our Baptist forebears were calling for the separation of church and state and religious liberty, realizing that the the way, the best vehicle for the New Testament church to carry out the gospel at the ends of the earth is to exist free and separate from the state, um, to carry out its mission. It doesn't, it's always going to be corrupted, it's the same. But that political and, and theological corruption happens so much during that time to where you have not just the rise of formal Roman Catholicism, but even Roman Catholic theology that was beginning to continue to spin out of control and tradition and different mystical practices and things like this, that even after the Reformation, the Roman Catholics said, we don't, need, we don't need to follow Luther, but we do need to kind of clean up and have what they call the Counter-Reformation. And it led them to clean up a lot of, not so much the theological, but the, but the political. So you, you just have a lot of distracting things in that time. So Luther didn't abandon um, all that he learned from great medieval theologians like Anselm and, and the, the early medieval period, and then Aquinas and, and others who were really um, preserving core doctrines. It's just so much that those theologians were separate from regular people, and the scriptures were removed from people being able to read it in their own language. Uh, I'm interested to ask, I was talking with Spencer during one of the breaks, and he said uh, probably the, the biggest criticism he has of uh, what you set up here was that he had access to Amazon while you were lecturing, uh, and that, that I think is, speaks for many of us. Um, but speaking about Baptist history, uh, are there maybe a character or two that you wish more folks uh, read about, knew about uh, in, in Baptist history, so kind of moving into the modern period, uh, that, that often get overlooked that we could Amazon their works? So I teach, one of the classes I teach at the seminary is called Baptist History, and you would, might imagine that most students are just so thrilled to take that class. It's like the thing they're just dying to sign up for. Uh, I love I that, too, because um, I get them in my classes, and I have to basically convince them why they need to love this class, and, uh, and I don't always succeed, but do more often than I don't, mainly because the Baptist tradition is just, again, it's one of those rooms off that hallway. It's, it's not the answer to everything. It's where God placed me. It's where I align most. Um, but the Baptist tradition is really a, ref a Reformation movement, is what it is. It's following the conclusions of the Reformation in all areas of doctrine, especially the doctrine of the church. And, uh, and when they realize it's rooted in the Reformation, and oh, by the way, it agrees with the things you think Scripture teaches about the church, well, now you find out you belong there and have a home. It's not to say that Baptists have always been helpful. There's been unhelpful components to what they've contributed throughout history, but... Um, so it's a delight to introduce them to people they've never heard of before. Um, I can't give you two, um, I can, but I'll try to keep it under five. But um, so, so really the recovery of the modern missions movement starts with two Baptist pastors, William Carey and Andrew Fuller. Uh, both of them are just, their lives and their thought can be readily found and are, are, um, are remarkable. 
uh, both of them, uh, as the missions movement took root in America, was eventually led to a phenomenal pioneer missionary named Adoniram Judson and his wife Anne. Their story is just phenomenal, uh, encouraging, inspiring, almost top to bottom, both theologically and biographically. Did I see you writing a book about him? Coming out soon? I, I, I am um, with one Sorry of to my, hijack your question. Yeah, you go back colleagues, on it, Thomas Kidd, who wrote the church history, he and I are writing a new biography of Judson. Um, and then the last I would mention is someone people don't always think of as a Baptist, but it was an evangelical theologian named Carl F.H. Henry in the 20th century. Uh, Henry, people have heard of Billy Graham. Uh, most people in this room over the age of 30 have heard of Billy Graham, but um, um, I know the younger generations maybe not as much. Um, Henry was basically Graham's theologian. So the, the evangelical movement in the 20th century, Henry's the one who helped put theological thought behind that, and he was proudly a Baptist, and so I encourage people to, to look at him. But yeah. That's really good. We, we live in a super transient age where uh, everything that is happening now seems to like it's outdated tomorrow. Uh, the technology we get now is not good, you know, in a month. Right. Uh, how does historical theology or thinking about like how the Lord's been at work in his church throughout the ages give comfort to the Christian, uh, courage to the Christian? Like, What does that do kind of in, in your soul as you think about that? Yeah, I mean, the, the Ecclesia- Ecclesiastes 1.9, there's nothing new under the sun, is true. It's true because it's in the Bible, but it's also true as it's played out throughout history. So there's nothing, and we don't say this with pride or as know-it-alls or anything else, but there's nothing that will come that, that, that either hasn't come before or that the past doesn't have answers for. So, and then you match that with what the Bible says is certain about the future, whether it comes in our lifetime or, or not. You have every reason to have hope, meaning there's no fad or popular preacher or what's on the cover of Time magazine that's going to derail the plan and mission of God. It's just not. And not only that, there's not, Christians have the ability to have good, solid answers to any question that comes. And historical theology can help them whether it's you know Mormonism or Jehovah's Witnesses or some fancy philosopher who seemingly has got all the answers for why Christianity's wrong, um, there's nothing new. And history, the more you know history, helps you understand. And even if you don't know it, you know that there's a way to find answers to it, and that that it can help you to to, to find it. So it, it I actually it gives you more hope and encouragement actually than discouragement. Uh, quick, uh, non-controversial political question for you. Uh, speaking as a historical theologian, you know, this year is the, um, I say this with my tongue lodged all the way through my cheek, the most important election ever, and four years ago is the most important election ever, and every election is the most important election ever. Uh, for Christians, kind of uh, hearing that and being bombarded heading into an election season, what, uh, what would you say as somebody who is, is familiar with uh, history in general, church history especially, is, is there comfort to be had? Could you give a, just a, a sentence or two of comfort to Christians that, that feel like maybe the world is teetering on the brink right now? Well, the world may be teetering on the brink. I mean, I, you know, we're not naive and don't have our head in the sand. And, and certainly, I'm not a political correspondent. I feel like I'm on CNN <laughs> or something right now. I, I don't know much about the present or the future. I live in the past. But... Um, uh, but the world may be teetering on the brink, and it could get worse before it gets better. So I don't, I don't think Christianity has a great answer to say everything's going to be fine. Just you know, hmm. um, that's not how we're supposed to face the world. We're supposed to face the world, being reminded that our citizenship in heaven is secure, and what does come, even if it's really bad, um, we will find a way to persevere and, and to come through it. So I take hope in those things rather yeah. than trying to somehow parse out how bad is this, or things like that. So I, I, I just have a sober um, but not despondent look about, about the future. And on my best days, it's because my hope isn't on those things. On my worst days, like many of you, it's like, what is, what is going on? You know? it, 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 it could be, you know, could, could be bad. This is, this is part of a multi-part question. So I don't know if we'll get all the parts, but at least going to get this part. I thought it was really interesting. And um, I know with uh, Midwestern's kind of emphasis on the local church, someone had asked, what role has the church, and your, your local church, of which you are a member of a, a local Southern Baptist church in, uh, near Midwestern there, what role has the local church family played in your research, just in your job and life? Yeah, it's played throughout, the, throughout my life of, since I became a Christian and being in churches. It's always played, um, I think how to answer that. It's always played an informative role. Uh, I, there's not a direct connection between it shaping the things I necessarily do academically. 
Um, but I'll, I'll answer it this way. I will say to me, um, still to this day, and this has been true throughout my entire Christian life, more often than not, the direction and counsel and help that I've needed just in my personal life, my family as a father, husband, professionally, stress, anxiety, and everything else, more often than not, the way that I found guidance from the Lord is through the preach word on Sunday morning, still to this day. I mean, that's just there, there. And, and I study the Bible personally and devotionally. I, you know, am, you know, those kinds of things regularly, but there's something about God's people gathered um, on the, the Lord's day to hear God's word. I think God uniquely blesses and uses that in ways that we understand. And preachers know this too. They'll just studying and preaching the text and have people come up and say, how did you know that that's what I needed to hear today? Well, they didn't know, <laughs> but, but God knew. And so regularly for me, the local church is just that um, anchor and, you know, I, I, need, I need to hear the word preached personally and I need the community that comes from that place. And that's what helps me to know what I'm supposed to do and where I go. I mean, I, I, um, I, we seek to be faithful church members and a part of that is just a, a, a attending and listening and giving and praying. So, yeah, that's yeah. good. I've just got one more and then I'll let uh, Josh wrap up. I, I know in, in studying history and in, in just any academic discipline, you're going to be reading and interacting with people that you would not put a blanket endorsement over everything they've written. And I know, especially as we seek to read widely in, um, in church history especially, uh, you're going to run into things that are, um, you know, you wouldn't endorse wholesale. So for somebody who might be skeptical or fearful of uh, studying history, because maybe it turns them into a Catholic, or maybe they, they read people that, w- that were heretics and are worried of, you know, kind of guilt by contamination, what, what would you say? How do you navigate that um, so that you, you know, don't run off the rails into, into heresy? Um, any advice for them? Yeah, the, the caution that's there, the Christians throughout the centuries, uh, throughout the years, have always been fearful of these things, and it's, it, the pendulum swings both ways, all the way to the banning of books, and, and we don't think about those things, we don't talk about those things, we, you know, all the way to complete liberty with no discernment, to where you're just imbibing and thinking through, and there's no... So I think somewhere in the middle, obviously, is there, so you have to be wise and discerning, but I'm, I don't think banning books is ever the, you know, or canceling someone entirely and things like that. The more one can be educated as to the context of what is, why do people have problems with this? Is it helpful to read or not helpful to read is probably the, the best way to go. There are bad books. There are bad things to read. There are evil things in the world that we probably should have no knowledge of. Um, so I'm not saying, you know, everything is, is needed or necessary, but I just think growing in one's discernment is the, the best way to do it. But in terms of particular figures, I mean, again, it's somewhat of even Luther and his anti-Semitism. I just prefer to hit that head on and say, here it is. I, I'm not upholding him as someone we should follow on every corner um, uh, um, or, or, or those things. But we can. God used him. I think he did. Uh, what can we glean from him that's helpful while at the same time recognizing the, the points at which we're unhelpful and, uh, and then, you know, drawing a circle around that and then, you know, moving on. Some honey from lions. There we That's go. That's right, yeah. Uh, speaking of, maybe I uh, had someone kind of put this question in. What are your thoughts on, you can go wherever you want to with this, what are your thoughts on Aquinas and his contributions to Christianity as well? Yeah, I, uh, Aquinas is helpful. It's hard, hard to read. Um, but Aquinas and Anselm both, uh, evangelicals have retrieved them. So Roman Catholics have retrieved them because their whole system of doctrine and medieval theology helps support a lot of Roman Catholicism. Evangelicals have always, back to that sobering or discerning component, have always found parts of them helpful, and I think those parts still are helpful today. So what I would do with Aquinas is not anything different than many evangelicals have done before, which is particularly in the doctrine of God or the defense of the existence of God. That's where I find Aquinas still helpful. His arguments for those things are still things that we could follow and use today. We have to be discerning, though, is when he moves into other doctrines, that there's a lot of things there that... I don't even know if are helpful to read. I mean, it's not that we become ignorant on them, but it's just not who you'd want to read on those doctrines. So, um, so that's, I find myself in conversations defending Aquinas, meaning, yes, there are problems here, but we shouldn't ignore the fact of this particular contribution. And at the other time, I find myself saying, he's not all great in every area, so, I mean, we don't need to champion him in, in, in that sense. So you kind of have to do that with a lot of figures. But if you think about he, if you notice how I even answered that question, I also kind of want to know, I want to know what have other believers done with these figures? I mean, who, I'm, I'm so limited in my experience and context, I don't know everything, but what have others done with them 
that they found valuable, maybe that's a model for how I should handle them in the same way, rather than charting off to do my own new thing. In historical theology and in, in life and theology, I'm always wary of anyone who says they're doing something new. I don't want to do anything new. I just want to retell what's happened before. That's of what's most valuable. You know? That's, that's yeah. super helpful. Uh, one thing we are committed to is making sure that we get out of here on time. And so uh, I just want to say thank you so much uh, for being a part of this today. I know it's not easy to come and give uh, multiple lectures and sit, sit, sit through a Q&A and you've traveled all this way. So thank you so much just for your time here and also just for your time and labor at Midwestern Seminary. Really excited, encouraged about what the Lord is doing in and through you and others I know are on that team as well at Midwestern. Many in this room are um, benefiting from that. And so thank you so much for that. Uh, Dr. Dusing will be around in the room for a little bit uh, as we're setting up. So that's going to lead me to one other thing. If you're able to and a part of our church, uh, we do need to use this room in a much different way in the morning. And so uh, as people are leaving, if, you, if some of you could stay and help us tear down the tables, we're going to bring chairs back in here and set the room up like we normally have it on Sundays. If you're a guest with us, you feel free to help, but don't, don't worry about doing that. Uh, but uh, we're really glad that you're here. Uh, like I said at the beginning, these workshops are kind of a part of our institute. Uh, and we seek to do a couple, one or two of these a year, and we hope that they are a blessing not just to our church family, but to other churches, to other believers uh, in our area. And so, so thankful uh, that you were able to be a part of that. If you are part of our church as well, we have a course uh, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. If you want to learn some more about what the Lord has been doing, our, own, our very own Pastor Gert uh, will be teaching a course uh, in church history at 9 o'clock, we'd love to have you there. If you haven't been a part of the first couple of classes, you're still time to jump into that so you can be here at 9 o'clock. And our Bible studies are also going on. Let me just encourage you to be a part of what the Lord is doing through our institute. Uh, we really do want to help to see people come to know and understand their Bibles better, to know and understand what they believe better, and to be able to articulate that, defend that, and teach their children that, teach their neighbors that, and literally take that message to the ends of the earth. And so that's what we're trying to do in our institute. So really glad to be a part of this. And looking forward to the rest. I'm going to ask John to come up really quickly. Uh, you're going to lead us in the last song because I messed this up when I try to do it. All right, we are going to stand really quickly. Let's stand. Uh, I, I asked John to come because there was one event where I tried to lead the ending song. And I started off too high and didn't realize it till I was about midway in. Verse 2, I thought I could correct it, and I went too low and got stuck again. And so we're going to have John lead us in the doxology uh, as we go out. But let me just say, I am super encouraged that you're here. I realize that this is a college football Saturday. And uh, I'm encouraged to see a room full of people that wanted to give up five hours of their day to think about what the Lord has been doing in his church throughout the ages. I pray you're edified in that. I pray you're encouraged by that. I pray you take what you learned here into other spaces that God might be glorified, right? That's the reason uh, why we've gathered here today.